Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke 16. Now there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word today. So we've set up this um, time of looking at um, how we see with that um, famous story um, that Isaac read for us. Now, sometimes it's the five blind men and the elephant, but it's more fun with mice, um, especially, you know, running all over the elephant, trying to figure it all out, right? Okay, maybe I'm just the one who's easily amused. Um, but it's how we see. And yes, there is absolute truth in what each of those mice found, whether it be that foot of a pillar or that spear of a tusk or that snake of a trunk or the rope of the tail or the cleft of the broad head or the fan of the ear, each of those is a very true part but it is a part, and there is a greater whole. And so one of the great gifts of coming together in community is that we bring our piece of the truth to the greater truth, to be able to share with each other. And we're able to do that some in worship, but it gets even better in Bible study. So that's a plug for study and small group because then you're able to piece that apart and put it back together um, in, a, in a very helpful way that helps us expand our understanding and deepen our faith. This is what we encounter in the lectionary readings today. Imagine, if you will, Jesus at a banquet, invited to eat, sitting down. It's a beautiful dinner. Things are going well. And he sees someone at the gate that no one else in the party sees. Now, it's not because they're evil people or malicious. We don't have any of that in the story of the rich man. It's simply not seeing. And so there's a parable, if you will. This is a little bit of midrash of playing. But I wonder if that banquet actually happened. And from watching that interaction and being able to see and then also see how others didn't see, Jesus put a parable together for us to talk to us, to teach us 
about seeing, to call us to look in a different way, to follow the lead of a God who does see and who does hear and who does come in the form of Christ to take on solidarity with us no matter where that might be. And so we come to this miracle of just being able to see. And for the rich man, this didn't happen until it was too late, until after death. Um, he didn't see the need that was around him from his gated community, if we want to put a finer point on what it might look like today. But in Hades, in torment, he looks up across the void and sees Lazarus. Now, this is the first time that he names Lazarus. So somewhere in that journey or in that midst, he learned a name and he could see but that's about as far as the learning goes, which is why this parable is so difficult to swallow. Because you would think that once the aim game is announced of who is in comfort and who is in torment, of how you can see the full spectrum, that understanding would click, right? I mean, this, at least it's clicked enough for this rich man that he's worried about his five brothers. But Lazarus is right there, and who does he talk to? This is a real question for those who are listening to Scripture. Abraham, does he even talk to Lazarus? <laughs> no. And what does he tell Abraham to do? Send Lazarus. Lazarus is still the servant. There's still the dynamic of power going on here. It's hard to see. It's a miracle when our eyes are opened and we're able to see something. And it's an even greater miracle when we see something and we're willing to keep looking. Because a lot of times it's too hard and it's too overwhelming and we're not equipped with how to deal with what we see. And so we stop looking. And that is the message from Jeremiah today. A prophet who saw what was coming when Jerusalem was going to be besieged, who kept calling the people to stop thinking that they could do anything because this is the temple of the Lord, um, but said that no, 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 no. There's a commitment to a covenant first before a geographic location or a people. And if we don't turn ourselves around to be the covenant people through whom God can bless all the families of the earth, then we're in trouble because that's what God's committed to. And the Babylonians come and Jerusalem is besieged and everything starts falling apart so much according to how Jeremiah had prophesied it um, that he's incarcerated for treason and he's put in jail. Because not only could people not see what he was begging them to see in time for something different to happen, then when it started to happen, they still couldn't see what Jeremiah wanted them to see, but merely projected it onto him, shut their eyes down, and put him away. But still the word of God came, and still Jeremiah chose to see, and a deed of land was purchased. And it was brilliant, right? This is not just a transaction. I'm helping out my cousin and taking care of him as next of kin um, would, according to the laws of this day. This is something I'm doing to help people see again. This is incredible prophetic action because in order for this deed to take place, the entire community has to get involved again. There has to be witnesses. It has to go before the court of the elders. Like, once again... There is an invitation to see, to see differently. And this time, it's not that everything is ending, that the world is ending. This one is an invitation to hope, that there will be a return, that even in the midst of everything going down as Jeremiah had begged people to try to prevent Instead of, which I don't know how Jeremiah did this, instead of the, uh-huh, I told you so moment of a lifetime, it's, okay, this happened, but now I invite you to see hope. And hope wouldn't happen 
without Baruch. We need both the prophetic seers and the trustees of that sight and of that vision to find the earthen jar, to care for it in such a way that it can last, that it can go through the crisis, and that it can come to the fruition of the prophetic sight that saw it before. So if you don't mind, if you would join with me in a little exercise on about how it is that these two miracles come about. I have two videos that Mike has amazingly put together last minute. Um, and so the first one to look to test the miracle of just seeing. All right, Mike. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? So count the passes of the team in white. The answer is 13. How close did you guys get? But did you All see right. the moonwalking bear? Now just watch, don't count. How many people saw the bear? All right, see, it's really hard to see something you're not trained and taught to look for. There's a miracle of sight, whether it be Lazarus or a moonwalking bear, you never know. There's also a miracle in being able to keep seeing. Um, and so as we do this discipleship journey together, where we help each other see and we help each other keep seeing, um, we celebrated last Sunday our third graders receiving their Bibles and beginning this journey with us. And today we have someone to talk to us who's just a few years into this journey from the third grade Bible. Um, but Lila wants to talk to us about something she's chosen to see and share why that's important. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> today is International Freedom Sunday, which is a day that the International Justice Ministry has created to encourage churches to spend a little time to bring awareness to a very real issue in the world, known as human trafficking. Most of you probably know a little, or maybe a lot, about the issue, so I'm going to keep this pretty simple. Human trafficking is modern-day slavery in a couple of ways. It is the second largest illegal business in the world, and the yearly profit is estimated at $32 billion in 2012 and has grown since. But most people don't really want to talk about it because it is very hard to talk about and think about. It is also a very underground business and often goes very unnoticed even when it is right in front of us. Now, this is what really made me stop and think. There are more human slaves today than ever, in, ever before in recorded history. There are over 40 million unrescued victims in slavery right now. Human trafficking is more common in poverty-stricken third world countries, but is still a huge problem all over the world and affects people in every social class. Human trafficking has been identified in every state of the United States. Maryland alone serves as a pass-through and destination because traffickers use the Interstate 95 to transport victims to different states, but especially big cities like Baltimore, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. In the United States, approximately 70% of the human trafficking victims' incidents occur at truck stops. Victims are also moved through well-known airports like DWI in Washington. For these reasons, victims and traffickers have told law enforcement that Maryland is a gold mine for human trafficking. After hearing all that, I couldn't stop thinking about it and wanted to learn more. I could go on and even and on even more than I already have about the issue, so I encourage you to also learn more information about the huge problem if you're interested. Um, Okay, so we as Christians have been shown God's love 
and that he wants us to help one another. Zechariah 7.9 says, This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion for one another. And Proverbs 29.7 says, The righteous care about justice for one another, but the wicked have no such concern. Probably one of the best ways you can help is just by finding how to identify human trafficking when you're out in public because it happens right in front of us. You could also just say a prayer for the victims. By being informed, you are helping stop human trafficking from being hidden in plain sight, which is a big step in the right direction for a much more free world. Thank you. Thanks, Lila. While I was working in D.C., we partnered with another um, church um, that was right along um, a known trafficking track um, in downtown D.C., um, and they shared stories with us um, about youth that had been recruited from Pentagon City Mall um, and people who are there specifically looking um, for youth who are alone and who are sad or in any many times after a breakup and then become friends, gain trust, um, and then move them. Um, it is a terrifying <laughs> concept to think about, um, but one that has been documented, and that is true. And so the question for us and how we choose to see um, that is before us is that there are real consequences for how we choose to see the world around us. And if we choose to ignore what is in front of us, then we have to know that there are others who are not ignoring, our teens or others. And so this is our work. This is our call as disciples, is to begin to unravel the enculturation that keeps us from seeing Lazarus at the gate, that keeps us from being able to speak directly to Lazarus even afterwards, so that we can build the relationships and be able to, in our faith journeys, see as God sees, little by little by little, so that we can be the partners with God to be about this kingdom work of God's call to Moses. I've seen my people. I have heard their cry. I know their pain, and I will deliver. This is our discipleship journey. And for those of us who find our place in this parable in Luke, there are not many times when we will know the vast extremes that are presented in this parable between the rich man and Lazarus. But I would invite us to find our place in this story as the five brothers. And what will it take for us to see what Lila has chosen to see what others have chosen to see. And how will we be the body of Christ together who take on this sight and respond in knowing and in walking with? So our commitment for this coming week is to practice how we see and is to practice that first miracle of choosing to see, whether that means specific conversation so that we see and understand an individual instead of just go with a much easier um, categorization of lumping everyone together. It means whether we take time to count and look at aggregate data instead of each specific case that we can just rationalize away. Whatever a step is, one, a step to see, and then two, a step to keep seeing and to keep looking. And yes, it gets overwhelming, but we're Christians, and the one thing that we can do is stop and take two minutes to pray and to let the news that we've encountered overwhelm us, but stay open So that if there is a call from the Holy Spirit in this moment, that we are in the space to hear that, or we can at the very least pray for openness, so that in that lifting up and that holding, God will be able to work through another 
who might be called to meet that need and respond to that crisis. As we go through Charge Conference and find our goals and as we go through this listening campaign together of meeting with each other to hear our stories and how we've grown in faith and what that's been about, part of our discernment process will be discerning Epworth's call. What is it that only Epworth um, can give to God to accomplish? And so we will be working on that together, and that will be in how we see and how we keep seeing and how we are the Baruch trustees that hold that hope and make it available and present for our city and for our community. Our closing hymn, if you would stand and join.